Good morning, October 25th, 2020. This is the Apostolic Church of Enfield and our Sunday morning lesson and pastor readout. We have spent 36 previous weeks uh, going through the study, The Eight Steps from Death to Life, which is the eighth lesson of the Foundations of Life Bible Study series. <clears throat> Today, we're at lesson number 37. Uh, I expect it to be the last. I think we're going to be able to get through the remaining portion of this lesson that I've intended to teach, and that will bring us to the conclusion of the Foundations of Life Bible Study series, unless the Lord commands something else. But I do want it to be a blessing to you. What we're going to talk about today is the cost of failure. I've been teaching you about the eight steps from death to life these 36 weeks, this the 37th, the eight fundamental principles that are the ways of God, the principles by which he operates, the order in which they come, the order in which he uses them, practices them, fulfills them, and expects us to experience them and to use them. We've been talking about the benefits of following God's way, and I've shown you examples of the eight steps from death to life, quite a few of them, although I've got 400 more that I'm not going to show you in this lesson, but I've shown you examples of, of the eight steps and how they are expressed in the scripture and examples of how they work in the lives of human beings. <clears throat> We've also talked about uh, crisis points and how the Lord uses them to get people who aren't going to uh, do what they need to do to commit what they need to commit to actually be a disciple of his to just go home and to get out of the program and not not be a hindrance to anybody else and but there's another way the eight steps are revealed in scripture and i want to share those with you in closing the lesson out and that's to talk to you about the real cost of failure what i mean by failure is not applying the eight steps from death to life in your thinking and in your doing, in your understanding. What happens if you don't do things God's way? And it's not pleasant, but we're going to, I hope, end it up right. Second Thessalonians 1.7 says, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. 2 Thessalonians 2, starting at verse 7, says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, and that means hinders, he who now hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan 
with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's why they perish, because they do not receive the love of the truth. And for this cause, them not having received the love of the truth is why they perish. And for this cause, God shall send them, those that do not receive the love of the truth, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Boy, that's, this is tough language, but it is true language. It's the word of God. Not everybody who thinks they're saved are going to be saved. There's a terrible end coming for some. And you don't want to be one of them. And I don't want to be one of them. And I don't want anybody to be one of them. <clears throat> so let's look at a way. One of the ways the eight steps from death to life is expressed, is revealed in Scripture. This pattern that God has given us for how to build our life. But we're going to look at it in the way the scripture reveals it in antithesis or the opposite of these eight steps. What happens if you don't follow the pattern as God has given it? You're going to follow the pattern, but not the way the Lord wants you to follow the pattern. The eight steps from death to life are revealed by the antitheses, the other way the pattern is followed. And the first way I want to share with you is titled, Holding the Truth in Unrighteousness. And it comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 24, and a tagline in verse 28. This is the opposites. What happens if you don't fulfill the principle as God has revealed it for you to fulfill? What will happen? And I'm going to give it these names, not that it's significant. But first is revelation, as it is in the eight steps from death to life. This is going to death to death. Then refusal, rejection, retention, regression, rotting, robbing, and ending in reprobation. I want to explain this to you as we go. In the title, which is from the text in Romans 18, there's the word hold. And that means to hold back or to detain, to retain. It's the opposite of to release. It means to suppress, to hold it down, to hinder it. It's not a good word holding the truth in unrighteousness means suppressing it fighting it resisting it holding it back let's let's read the text <clears throat> in romans 1 starting at verse 18 for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's where I got the title for this, holding the truth in unrighteousness. It is going to be what provokes the wrath of God because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. They've been given the truth. God's given it. 
God has manifested it, and it's been manifested in our lives. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Let me pause there. Anybody who tells you that the Godhead is a mystery, an unknowable mystery, something that you can't just have to take by faith, they are lying to you, whether they know it or not. They are still lying to you because the eternal power in Godhead is clearly seen and understood. God has already manifested it and made it known unto us so that they are without excuse. Well, I didn't know. Why didn't you know? God revealed it. He manifested it. He made it clearly seen and understood. And if you don't know it, you got the problem. You're without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, stop a minute, stop a minute. Did they know God? Yes, they did. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And that word vain is attached to idolatry. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, or because of that, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. <clears throat> now let's see how the eight steps pattern is revealed here in its opposites. Revelations, first step, when they knew God. God has revealed himself as the only God and Savior. His absolute unity is visible in and explained by his creation. There is no excuse for not accepting the truth of Jesus Christ as both the only Lord God Almighty and his manifestation in flesh to be Savior. Psalm 19.1 told us, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. <clears throat> so don't say, well, we, we didn't know. You got no excuse. Deuteronomy 29, 29 said, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the works of this law. It's been revealed. 
But when they knew him, they didn't accept that revelation. They glorified him not as God. Instead of accepting the revelation and the full implications of it in their own lives and theologies, they refused it. They glorified him not as God. They made him another Jesus, not quite altogether the Almighty God, a co equal, or not even God at all, or a man God adopted, or, or any of the other theologies, but the one that states that the transcendent, everlasting, and Almighty God manifested himself in flesh and all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in that man, Jesus Christ. Not giving the Lord Jesus Christ his rightful place as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That's what they did. Diluting his revelation by refusing to recognize your own depravity. Refusal may take the form of compromising the revelation to make it a little more acceptable to those that don't believe it. Denying his conclusion that all are under him. What follows that? Neither were thankful. That's rejection. They, they didn't accept his gift. They didn't accept his revelation, nor the offer of his salvation. They were not thankful. They didn't care that he so graciously provided a plan of salvation. They did not diligently search it out because they refused to accept him as the only true God, both Lord and Savior, and themselves as totally lost in sin. You see, gratitude demands full responsiveness and they did not respond they rejected it the fourth step in the antithesis the opposite of repentance they didn't get to repentance because they didn't respond properly because they refused to recognize themselves and him as their savior even though he'd revealed himself but what happens then? They became vain in their imaginations. They believe there's no need to change the very motives of their life. They think they can make it as they are or that there will be no eternal judgment. They get all the foolish ideas. They didn't accept the revelation and that causes them to refuse to accept their need for salvation and deliverance, which causes them to reject his plan of salvation. And the only possible result is getting worse. Change is absolute. No one but God stays the same. So a decision to stay the same is the same, has the same results as regression. And that's the fifth step. That lack of repentance brings them to the place where their foolish heart was darkened. You know, the word foolish means no knowledge of God. Believing God to be something he's not or someone he's not. Foolishness. You're become hardened against their need of remission and lack of compassion for others who need compassion and remission. And when you don't forgive, boy, the forgiveness God would have heaped on you, the remission of sin, the undoing of your sin that God would have heaped on you is eliminated from your life. And the result is a dark, dark heart. And that results in them rotting, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools, got worse. Claiming self-sufficiency by their actions or their words or their attitudes, 
thinking themselves that they do not need the constant involvement of the Spirit of God to prosper themselves and others. That's rotting. The only way to escape this hell-bound slide is to go back where you lost it. Go back to that revelation and follow the process of his salvation. Failure to do that causes you, allows you to rob God. And that's that seventh antithesis step, robbing and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. You know where it changed? He's uncorruptible. You're not gonna change him. You're not gonna change the truth of him, except in the minds of men, in your own mind, and in the minds of those who listen to you, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God. You will limit God to the baseness of human conception by failing to fully accept his, re his revelation, transferring worship to people and things instead of to him, by considering yourself to be the master of your life, you deny God his position and power in your life. You're robbing him. You haven't changed God. You've merely robbed him of his rightful place, power, and glory in your life until the judgment. He will not tolerate your thievery. And that leads to the eighth and final step in the antithesis, and that's reprobation, which is found in these words. Wherefore, because they failed in those first seven steps. They did the opposites. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. And as it says in verse 28, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You only beat that by applying God's principles in your life. Revelation, recognition, responding, repenting, remission, receiving, remaining, and reproducing. If you don't do it God's way, the end is not good. So there it is. They had the revelation but they didn't accept it. They refused what God revealed about himself, and they refused what that revelation revealed about them, and didn't recognize him as God and them in need of him. And that meant they rejected his plan, they retained their corruption in their motives, and they regressed in their uh, relationships with God and man and, and to themselves, and then they rotted and they robbed God of all of his glory and God gave them up to reprobation. That's a way the eight steps were revealed. <clears throat> in the opposites, in the antithesis of the way of God, you have this choice to do it the way God said to do it, or to go to destruction. That's the choice. Now there's another way, the final way, that I'm going to talk to you about in this lesson. And I call it a walk in the world, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. This again is an antithesis to the eight steps from death to life. I'm going to ask you to follow very closely the words as they are given to us. Vanity of mind, blindness of heart, ignorance, alienation, understanding darkened, being past feeling, 
given to lasciviousness, working all uncleanness with greediness. Now I'm going to show you why this is the order in the passage. Ephesians 4, starting at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, or from now on, walk not as other Gentiles walk. Now stop a moment. Let me remind you, we need to be walking on the way of the Holy One, that highway that gives us the glorious entrance, the abundant entrance into the kingdom. Don't walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. In the written notes, there's an appendix in lesson one, not, not the first lesson of the eight steps, but actually in lesson one, the revelation of God from eternity to eternity, maybe in this lesson also, there's, there's a chart that shows you the relationship between the word vanity and idolatry in Scripture. The vanity of their mind. That doesn't mean thinking how pretty they are. No, it's talking about having idolatrous ideas about God in their mind. Thinking of him as being someone he's not, something he's not. Of thinking ways he does not. Gentiles walk not in the way of holiness, not in the way of the Holy One, but in the vanity, in the emptiness, in the meaninglessness, in the foolishness, in the idolatry of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, I hope you're paying attention to the highlighted verbs. Having already the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. It is important to note the specific order that is stated for how this develops, how these things develop. It begins with the vanity of the mind. But the next failure is the beginning of all the other failures that are mentioned. Blindness of heart causes the ignorance that is in them and the ignorance that is in them is through the ignorance they are alienated from the life of god and that alienation darkens their understanding the blindness of heart causes ignorance and through that ignorance they are alienated, made foreigners from the life of God, and that alienation darkens their understanding. Darkened understanding puts them past feeling. <clears throat> and being past feeling causes them to give themselves over to indulge in ever-increasing measures their selfish, sensual desires. And the result of being led by this carnal worldly mindset is death. Let's look at it a little more closely. The vanity of mind. That's the root of their problems. Not accepting the simple truth of the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ holding a contrary concept of the Godhead through their intellectual and tradition-bound pride. That produces the second stage, blindness of heart. 
That's caused by the vanity of their minds, blindness of heart. Failure to recognize the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, his grace, his holiness, and that failure results in you not recognizing your own condition of wretchedness, misery, poverty, blindness, and nakedness. That's what results when you don't accept the revelation of Jesus Christ, when you refuse it. And that blindness of heart causes the ignorance that is in them, not knowing the truth and the ways of life results from never having been motivated to search the word of God for the plan of salvation in life. Oh, but Brother Readout, I, I did search it out, and there it was Acts 2.38. No, I think you got a mistake there. It didn't start at Acts 2.38. It started at Acts 2.36. And, of course, that, that particular problem of the ignorance that is in them results in them being alienated from the life of God. Listen, even the prophets said it. My people are destroyed, destroyed, destroyed for lack of knowledge. And the Lord said, because you didn't accept the knowledge of me, because you didn't want to know me, I don't know you. Alienated, made foreigners, put out of the kingdom, deported from the way, alienated from the life of God. The life of God in Christ is selfish, selflessness and sacrifice. And if you retain ignorance, you are an alien, foreign to that attitude, having only selfish motives, the opposite of repentance. Colossians 1.21 said, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. You don't want to be an alien. Understanding darkened, that's what follows because of your alienation from the life of God. You have nothing to share. You, you your understanding is darkened. You cannot accept the reasons why people do the wrong things they do and extend mercy to them because you understand it was extended to you. You never truly understand the processes of godly living because you're a stranger to the life of God. You don't receive remission of sins, and you can't offer any when people sin against you. You have no joy, and joy is recognition of God's working in your life to save you. And you could contrast this verse to what we've been told. In Ephesians 1.18, he said, but you, the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You know, doing it God's way is better than it doing it your way. Just a fact. And, of course, because of your increasing lack of understanding, you get to the place where you're past failing. You're unmoved by the needs of others. I'll never forget, I had a conversation with a Jewish man. He was Jewish by ancestry, not by religion. But he said he feel worse about seeing a dog get hit by a car than he would by seeing a man get hit by a car. And his idea was, wait, I don't have any problem with a man upstairs as long as he leaves me alone. Yeah, you talk about being past feeling, more concern about the, the so-called rights of women than the rights of that unborn child. They're willing to murder the child, 
to make some convenience for uh, um, other people. Past feeling, unmoved by the needs of others, not forgiving, not long suffering, no justice in their understanding at all, no conscience that inclines them toward being a peacemaker, and little or no tolerance for anybody that disagrees with them. You know where our nation is today. Their life is empty and devoid of power, even though they would never admit it. And yet they still search for some form of fulfillment. And that leads to all kinds of debaucheries. Because their past feeling, they give themselves over to lasciviousness, a preoccupation with bodily comforts and sexual pleasures. And this is exhibited by excessive and unrestrained excitement of their physical senses to accomplish personal gratification. You become more involved in moral impurity. You pray less than ever before, unless you get into big trouble recognizable trouble. You think evil thoughts, you tell evil stories. You freely degrade the reputations of others in order to exalt yourself. And what happens? God gives them over to work all uncleanness with greediness because of having given themselves over to sensual pleasures. God gives them up to work all uncleanness with greediness. There will be no evidence of Christ within because they are given over to selfishness. This is reprobation. It's rejoicing in iniquity, in hypocrisy, and in being unloving. It is a life that is unacceptable to God. And it is experiencing the peace of the world. Vanity of mind, idolatrous concepts of God causes blindness of heart. And that causes ignorance of the ways of God and the things of God. And that causes you to be alienated from the life of God. And that alienation causes your understanding to be darkened. And when your understanding is darkened, you lose your care about the things of God and about others. And that causes you to give yourself over to sensual pursuits, and that ends up in God giving you over to reprobation, to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's selfishness. Because you have been taught the truth, stop being infantile. Stop chasing after every new doctrine. From now on, dear one, be adult in your Christian walk. Don't conduct yourselves like unsaved people do. Romans 8, 6 tells you, For to be carnally, fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is life and peace. In Philippians 4.8 tells you the eight principles you got to think on to be spiritually minded. Second Peter 1 tells you the eight principles you have to have in you and, and build in you in order, in order to have life and peace. So those two examples, I didn't spend near as much time on either one of them as I would if I were teaching them separately. But both of those are examples of the 
opposites that happen when you don't follow the eight steps from death to life in building your Christian life. Now, to conclude the whole series of the Foundations of Life lessons and this lesson, the eight steps from death to life convert the straight gate and narrow way into the kingdom of God into an abundant entrance. The eight steps from death to life convert that hard to find gate and harder to enter gate into one that is ministered, served up to us abundantly. The Almighty God has revealed his ways. The eight fundamental principles that arise from the very depth of his being. When he revealed them to me in scripture, he told me, these are my ways. Everything I do that relates to the saving of a man follows this pattern, and I never vary from it. Second Peter 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his, not theirs, his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him, not them, him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby that knowledge are given unto us great and exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Eight steps, one at a time, in order, in sequence. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, that's why I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. God doesn't share honor. 
God doesn't share glory. He was being recognized to them as God manifest in flesh. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That doesn't mean, oh, I think he's doing a good job. It's I am in him. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also, in addition to that, a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I want to ask you, I want to beg you, build your life God's way by following the eight steps from death to life. Learn them. Learn how they are applied in the plan of salvation. Learn how they're applied in day-to-day -day crises and situations and build your life that way, in that order. Not trying to skip ahead, but following that exact same pattern. Not doing it is a bad idea but doing it brings the reward that God wants you to have. Thank you for having paid attention to me all these 37 weeks of this lesson and all of the years before as we went through the Foundations of Life Bible Study Series. The eight steps from death to life is the summary of the other lessons and I wish to thank you. It's been my privilege to share the lessons with you since September 11th of 2011 and now we'll move on to other things. Will you bow your heads again? Lord Jesus, I'm very thankful to you for having revealed this pattern to me back in February of 1976 and for helping me to understand it and for showing me the many, many ways you've demonstrated that these eight things are your ways, your principles and expressed throughout the scripture and that if we follow your pattern, do things your way, that you will give us, minister to us an abundant entrance into your kingdom, and will be on the way in which we cannot fall. I'm sorry, Lord, to say I wish you didn't have it so that I had a choice, that I have the possibility of turning off the way, but Help me, Lord, to continue to walk in the way with you and help those in this audience and in my congregation, Lord, to learn these principles and apply them consistency in their lives. We want to be what you want us to be. And we'll thank you for making it so. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, loved ones. God bless you. Bye.